the uh, I guess the uh, podcast I'm starting up. Um, so I was actually raised in a uh, more religious Taoist family. I actually um, ended up going to Johns Hopkins and studied medicine. So I kind of moved more towards the uh, secular side of things. And I'm more interested in talking with people with interesting ideas and views uh, because I'm interested to know what people believe and why they believe it. Sure. And um, it seems like you're very, very passionate and a really well-spoken on the topic that you talked about. Well, I discovered your, um, actually, I think I discovered you through your podcast uh, interview with Ono, Ross, and Carrie. <laughs> um, oh, right. Which was great because they were very, very witty, but you were able to kind of match them with their wittiness, which I thought was really awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I yeah. tried to, because of my training in, um, you know, because I did high-level tech support for so long, uh, that was basically one of the things I could do. And that is I didn't, whatever the temperature, whatever the pace of whoever it is on the other side of the phone, I tried to keep it sort of a balance because that way they felt more comfortable. Okay. And so, um, yeah. so yeah, actually, I guess to get started, um, maybe have, uh, uh, you introduce yourself and a little bit about your background because sure. I, uh, I see that you said you were a professional video game player. I'm kind of curious to know about that because yeah. You know, the gaming scene back uh, probably in your days is very, very different than the esports scene that's happening now. Very different, yeah. So I, um, I'm older, uh, so I, I grew up in the 80s, and the, you know, back there was no internet any, anywhere close. And uh, when I got out of college, I there there wasn't a lot in the in the tech world. The tech world didn't really even exist when I got out, the internet had just started, just started learning to crawl. And I won in the mid nineties, I won a little computer game tournament that was worldwide. Um, the developer was out of Tokyo and the publisher was out of Boulder, Colorado. And one of my prizes for winning the game was reviewing one of their games that was in beta. And I gave it just mm -hmm. a skate. I just, I hated it. I thought there was a lot of things wrong with it. <laughs> and not not that they couldn't be fixed, but there were a lot of things wrong with it. And the developer agreed with everything I said. And uh, and the publisher was impressed enough that he said, you know what, why don't you come out to Colorado and and work for us? And so, and remember, most of the game developer, the game developing world in the United States was almost exclusively in Southern California. I mean, there's a little bit in Northern California, but there's some, in, uh, most of it was in Southern California. So I go out to Boulder, Colorado, never been out there in my life. And I realized when I got out there that I was one, of, I was the only person in the company who actually played games. Hmm. And so they hired me as a ringer, basically, to, to go to conventions like Macworld Boston and Macworld San Fran and E3 and places like that and make the games look better than they actually were. And okay. <laughs> that's what we did. I mean, that's that's what I did. And so, uh, and that's that was in the mid '90s. There was not a lot out there in the in the gaming world. And so, you, I knew all these guys that that were in the that now are gaming legends. Uh, it, it was it was so so much fun. And uh, I never, if if I had to turn back time, I never would have uh, undid that. I thought that was it was really a lot of fun. But after that, I, I jumped over because that company wasn't going to last forever. I won't get into why they, they eventually crashed. Uh, so I ended up teaching proprietary software for different companies around Boulder, Colorado for the better part of 20 years. And okay, yeah, that's that's, that's that was basically my background. Uh, a lot of tech, uh, you know, just going through the paces, you know, when when dial up modems were the thing and, and <laughs> then and. and Oh, I mean, everything was so rudimentary compared to what it is now, and that's how I cut my teeth on things. And um, while I was doing that, because I never got married, never had kids, uh, I was on the internet a lot. And there was eventually, if you're on the internet, I mean, nowadays it's a little tougher because the internet's so deep and so broad. But but I got into conspiracies a lot back then. That's how I eventually got into what I'm doing now. Because if you look at just about every conspiracy, sooner or later you're going to run into flat <laughs> Earth, and that's how I got into it. Yeah. So that's what I read on your um, bio. Uh, you said that you were looking into flat Earth in 2014, which you thought at that time was the most ridiculous theory, right? Um, and ended up being convinced and 
since then you started releasing a series of YouTube videos called Flat Earth Clues, right. which have kind of exploded over the last few years to the point that you are being booked to do speeches on uh, interviews. Um, yeah. In fact, you just, did, you just said you did another interview right before you did this call. So yeah, yeah. A high, like a, a high you're school. in demand. <laughs> well, I don't know about being the man, but what, what I did was, look, I'm not going to toot my own horn here. I'm, it's... But, but, I never ever one. I never wanted to be famous ever. Uh, I just wanted to be right. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it <laughs> comes to doing stuff in the flat Earth community, I made myself more available than most of the other people. I just because I I felt like I didn't have anything to lose, so I put out my phone number and my real name and my address and and just about every piece of personal information I could throw out there without my putting out my social number and my bank account. Um, mm -hmm. and, and people, and, and plus you, you make yourself available and you make yourself approachable and people mm -hmm. will approach you, you know, just don't come off as, you know, some scary, creepy Ted Kaczynski, uh, Unabomber conspiracy guy. And that's what, that's my, that's my hook, which is, look, I'm, I'm easy to talk to for, for the most part, at least I, that's what I hear. And so, yeah, I, 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 I think so. Yeah. Because I was, uh, too kind of get the because I, I was looking into I guess ever since the flat earth thing came back out I started looking back into it and I was watching a bunch of videos and a lot of people do seem very very aggressive like they think everyone is a uh, CIA shill or right. Right. Uh, that guy who was attacking that NASA scientist saying do you hate Americans and that's just that's probably pretty low right there. And, and But you seem very, very friendly and open to talking about it, even though people might outright think that your theories are crazy. Well, uh, you, yeah, you stand by your beliefs and you present facts. You're right. And the, remember, the conspiracy world up until very recently was very dark. You know, and that's people, yeah. people like their conspiracies like they enjoy Batman movies. And meaning by that, they all they want every Batman movie to be Heath Ledger as the Joker. And, you know, be dark and sinister and all this stuff and, and brooding, this brooding tone. That's what the conspiracy world was. And Flat Earth is not that. Mm -hmm. um, Flat Earth is about hope and optimism and people write songs about it and they do meetups and they throw parties and we go to conferences. And it's very, yeah, very... Actually, I think I want to get into that a little bit later because I yeah. see parallels with the uh, Flat Earth community and other fandoms I've been involved in, especially the concept of thinking you're alone until you find community online. That online community inspires a whole entire new wave of creativity, art, music, uh, videos, to eventually wanting to do meetups and eventually form their own conventions and stuff. Which, right. uh, that's, that's, that was actually my experience with the uh, My Little Pony fandom. My Little Pony, when it got started, people were like, oh, this is actually a interesting deconstruction on what should be an indie's nostalgia cash grab for girls. Ended up attracting a lot of people online for online communities. All of a sudden, you saw this boom of creative artwork, music, all this talent, and eventually, these individuals started creating their own conventions. And I think, aside from the Star Trek conventions, the My Little Pony conventions have been the largest of the individual fandom conventions. And when I was watching, I, I think the most uh, flat Earth documentary that was on NASA, I mean that that was on Netflix. Right. I was seeing you describe that how the flat earth community kind of came to better, better and evolved to the point it was. I, because I'm currently writing a book myself on the history of individual fandoms and their conventions and just seeing how that community got started, I thought was very, very similar to how a lot of modern like fandoms and groups got started today. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very similar. Uh, I mean, why wouldn't there be parallels between mainstream media conventions and what we're doing? But we follow basically the same formula which is we, we all use social media. I mean, really, social media and the internet, high-speed internet, changed the game. Uh, it, you know, initially, yeah. initially yeah. when eBay came out, of course, it crushed all the collectible markets initially because all <laughs> of a sudden things that we thought were really, really rare uh, was, were only rare because people weren't talking to each other. And then yeah. all of a sudden it's like, oh, you've got one of these, well, you've got one of these. And then as the internet got bigger and bigger uh, and people, you know, to where everyone was involved in the internet, all of a sudden, yeah, these social community, um, I'm sorry, social um, groups 
could were attracted to each other and you could yeah you could it was very easy to do a convention just about anywhere you wanted it's like oh hey let's do a power rangers convention hey let's do a video game game convention hey let's do a trek a star wars a comic books goes on and on and on and on uh and it's easy to do because now we can contact each other so quickly anyway sorry go ahead yeah so i i just thought that was a very interesting parallel because um i was actually in seattle last weekend for the uh, emerald city comic con oh. and uh, again, happened to stumble across a Netflix documentary at that time, and I was like, "Oh, that's very interesting parallels." Because I was there doing my own talk on the history of like different fandoms, and just seeing how you were describing it in the documentary was like, yeah, like you were saying, it's I guess it's the internet now kind of doing this. So when you think about it, the internet, is just making communication a little bit faster because back before the internet. A lot of fandoms were kind of run through like the fanzine culture, the mailing list, <laughs> where right, they would. Right debate each other through the mail which was it's longer than twitter or online forms but it's essentially the same thing just a little bit slower <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh it's amazing how fast and i've done i think the i it's been some years since i did the last comic-con uh down in san diego and uh but yeah the internet really really did change everything along those lines because it gave people they didn't have to wait it, it wouldn't wasn't instant gratification but it was way faster than it used to be and you, you could, everything was in front of you. It was like you didn't. It wasn't this big long journey to get there. It's like, well, how do I get there? And and what, trying to collect information was is now much much quicker. And even even to the flat Earth, which is shouldn't be even a thing, and yet it is. Sorry, go ahead, Lou. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah. So it's what's interesting is this this current flat Earth movement kind of came about because I think what you're talking about, the new uh, movements on the internet, how communication has been faster, probably the rise of like YouTube and Twitter, right. because I kind of, I, so I, my first, um, my, the first time I ever even heard of flat Earth was probably back when I was in military academy, um, probably back in 2006, 2007. Okay. And for the S, my SAT test, uh, one of the SAT tests was talking about the Flat Earth Society, uh, specifically the 2004 one started by, I think, Daniel Shelton, I think, was the yeah, individual yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, who resurrected who resurrected it as a little form. I thought, OK, this is kind of interesting. There's actually people who believe it. And so it's funny that the SAT test was the one that introduced me to it. I looked at the uh, form back then. I think they even had a uh, Facebook page, but their mailing list was like only 160 people. And then, like, every other year, I would just check up on it to see how much it has grown. And it kind of looked like it stagnated under 200 until eventually it just collapsed and disappeared entirely. Right. So I was actually surprised to see after I, – I thought this was the last of the Flat Earthers, this tiny little group. And all of a sudden, just a few years ago, entire new wave of Flat Earthers kind of emerged. New videos, new memes, uh, new groups and forums kind of took place and I, I just thought it was a fascinating transition from a group that a lot of people thought were disappearing and dying to all of a sudden booming and coming very very big yeah flat earth 2.0 really is what what it could be called uh, the old flat earth society is what i call flat earth 1.0 and you're absolutely right they were completely stagnant they weren't doing anything uh their forums were a joke in fact their forums had more trolls in it than actual people and I was really, <laughs> in fact, dedicated trolls, which I talked about in my clues, which really, really surprised me. It's like, okay, why are you guys here? If you want, if you're a troll and you want to make people cry on a regular basis, you can go to YouTube and it's fertile ground. You can, you can torture people all week long on, on YouTube. And I am going, I will take credit for part of this in that what was happening in 2014 was there were a couple people that were making some new flat earth videos and, but there were higher level than than what the average person on the street could absorb and when i was looking at it and in fact i even joined one of those flatter societies you were talking about uh the one um, in fact i think thomas dolby was like one of the, the 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 first members they invited on there which is interesting and he, i when i got into it i tried to boil it down call it luck call it timing call it synchronicity but the training that i had which was taking proprietary software and boiling it down to very, very easy to understand digestible pieces because I was teaching this software to blue collar workers most of the time. Uh, I, so I made a series of videos called Flat Earth Clues and how it, how I lucked out was when I put it out there, yeah, it was Flat Earth 101. Basically, it's all it was. 
But when people got into it, when they got past it and they wanted to read more, now that they already had the 101 stuff, they could work backwards into the people that had already done stuff in 2013 and 2014. And so now they had then they had quite a quite a bit of concepts they could digest afterwards. And then that all of a sudden started a whole new wave of people that were coming forward. Uh, and uh, I, I I won't I won't give out too many names, but what happened was people said, well, if if Flat Earth is this easy to understand, I can make videos on it too. And then it just started spreading from there to where people got really excited about it and were opening brand new YouTube channels were, were just firing off everywhere, we're talking about different different aspects of Flat Earth. And then that caught, it, it started out very, very organically. And then, of course, the celebs got in. So, sorry, that's my, my opening ramble. Oh, no, I think that's, that's great to hear the history from that perspective. Yeah. Now, do you know of any people from the, I guess, the uh, Flat Earth uh, 1.0, like you were saying, kind of migrated over to the new Flat Earth no, movement? Or almost, have they kind of distanced themselves? They, I, I don't even know who they are. If they did oh. move, if they did move over, they never told us. Uh, in fact, there was, I think <laughs> we were in like 18 months and one of the guys, it wasn't Shenton, it was another guy. He contacted me from one of the other Flat Earth Societies because there was a few of them out there. Not many, but there was a few. And he starts say, you know, saying, oh, I like what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and we want to kind of want to get involved. And I had to stop him. And I said, hey, no offense, but where have you guys been? You know, we've, we've been rip, we've been just ripping it up for the last 18 months. And now you're coming in and saying, oh, yeah, you're doing some good work. It's like we they were so far in our rear, rear, rear view mirror by the time they approached us that it was like, sorry, we don't we don't need you. We and that's, you know, our, like our first conference in, in Raleigh, the, which you saw in the in the, uh, the documentary. There, nobody from there was in a was in the flat earth society none of the speakers that were in there at all they in fact one of the prerequisites uh, wasn't mandatory was that you had to have a, a youtube channel with a decent size following and that's kind of how we picked the people that, that spoke at the conference oh that's interesting yeah. um and you you did mention like i guess the issue was there there's there's been a lot of issues with trolls now how I, I guess, yeah, because I, I think with any group, you'll always have your trolls. Right. But how do you kind of deal with the trolls? Like, because I know some channels, they would have to, like, lock comments and likes. And then other Facebook groups might have to have a process where moderators have to approve new members. Um, how has the current group been trying to deal with the uh, influx of trolls? It really varies. It's a it's a individual by individual basis. So some people have thicker skin than others. Like, for me... My rule, and what I tell people, I might as well have a T-shirt written up: Don't feed the trolls. Don't give them. <laughs> don't give them anything to chew on. So when they email me, for the most part, I don't. And very few actually email me. Most of them just stay in the YouTube comments because one of the great things about having trolls is they have to remain anonymous. That's the whole point of being a troll. Yeah, you have to be anonymous. So there's only so far they can get. Um, some people, yeah, they moderate the hell. I mean, I know channels that sanitize just about every comment that goes into YouTube, which has got to be exhausting. There's people that, that sanitize their Facebook pages, uh, but most of the time they just don't feed them. However, that being said, the flat earth thing has gotten so big that now there are dedicated troll channels, which get a lot hmm. of hits. And all they do is troll flat earth in videos. Uh, some some put their faces out there, but not their name. Very few people, very few trolls will ever use their real face and their real name. They'll either do one or the other. Either they'll use, um, well, maybe it's their name, I don't know. Use, they'll be completely anonymous, or they'll just put, they'll put, they'll put their face out there, but they won't give out any personal information. And we've got a, I mean, there's a How? bunch with tens of thousands of subs, and all they do every week, I mean, to where there's like dedicated days, like Tinfoil Hat Tuesday, or flat flat tarred <laughs> Friday, I mean it is. Oh, I mean every week they're relentless coming at us and says something. Have any like actually try to show up to in person meetings or conferences and like confront or no. have they come as more curiosity saying, "Oh, this is interesting. Let's if, check it out." If they do, they're scared. You remember because if you're a troll, you don't want to show up at a conference and then be it's like oh now we know what you look like and you know what we're gonna throw you down an elevator <laughs> shaft type thing because uh, because the flat earth community is very very passionate however the, the closest i think we ever got 
there was a troll that bought three tickets to the conference in Raleigh. And but they okay. they did it under an under al, obvious aliases and when we told them it's like no we're not going to give you passes based on an alias you've got to use your real name they never showed up and uh, hey. but we kept their money because there's no refund <laughs> yeah that's a, that's an interesting situation um, so I, I guess um, yeah because it's an interesting situation because not everyone is on board the flat earth movement a lot of people still think it's crazy out there fringe. Um, but you have been doing a lot of interview like, with, uh, I think, um, both mainstream and uh, non-traditional media. Right. Um, I think some people actually do or are uh, genuinely curious to hear your point of view, whether they agree with it or not. But some, I, 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 I could, it's easy to see they're kind of viewing you in a facetious manner, kind of, oh, let's have this strange person on here to talk about crazy views and oh, yeah. suddenly mock him how, how, like how do you kind of deal with uh, these different uh how, how, do you, how do you know which places you want to interview with and if they all of a sudden kind of mock you facetiously uh up to your face how, how do you kind of deal with that there's nothing you can really do um i i, have, I, I learned early on that uh you can't judge a book by its cover so there have been so I, early on i tried to do what you were just saying which is okay maybe i won't do some maybe i won't do others or i'll i'll go into it with a different attitude you know like some i would go in defensive thinking they're going to come straight at me and others like when i did um uh good morning london a couple years ago uh, or a year and a half ago anyway uh with piers morgan right he's he's on the other side of this <laughs> and you know, he's got an astronaut literally sitting next to him and I'm coming in through video, and I'm thinking they're they're going to attack. And Piers didn't attack. Now he didn't let me. He didn't. He tried to defend uh, the astronaut as best he could. But so, so anyway, the point is is that sometimes you can't really bet on that. So I just do them all anyway, and I go in with almost no expectations at all, and just let it happen, and be like, because I'm confident enough. Look during my uh, my support years when i was doing all that high level support i dealt with a lot of high stress people people that yelled that screamed that cried threatened with lawyers uh some <laughs> even threatened physical violence which of course never materialized oh, well it happens i mean when you're talking about very expensive software and something breaks oh yeah people people want your head so when somebody comes at me it's like let them i, I in fact with the flat earth the reason why i can't get mad at them is because five years ago I would have been them. I would have been on the other side of that coin. Yeah. And so, fine, let them let them attack if they want. Uh, what what are they going to do? How how bad are they going to do it? It's like, look, I opened my day with flat Earth. I know how crazy it sounds. Plus, I tried to disprove it for nine months. So, what what can you say that I haven't heard? Uh, you want you want to call it crazy? I mean, it's not a rebuttal. So I, I try to tell them if they go too far, mm -hmm. I I which is rare. Uh, in media nowadays, I, I try to say, look, yelling isn't a rebuttal, profanity isn't a rebuttal, and um, insults aren't aren't a rebuttal. So if that's all yeah. you got. Fine, my point will still get across. So you can you can come at me with what you want. So no, I don't. In fact, the only interview I think I ever turned down, there's been a couple, but they were troll, literally troll channels. Uh, in fact, one of them was a, 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 a like he was head of some atheist group and he wanted to come after me but if he wanted to come after it from a religious standpoint and i was like well hmm. i don't know if that's going to be the best thing in the world uh so anyway that's all i got yeah i have noticed that it's the atheist channels lately that's been doing their flat earth debunking videos a lot it's tough you um, you will have yeah. honestly it's not that flat earth will kill off atheism but it ha it will reduce its numbers way down there because by the, by default, if you believe that the world is enclosed, you know, if, if you're in a building, well, then it was built. And uh, hmm. then, then you're splitting hairs. It's like, okay, an advanced civilization or the divine, you pick. But either way, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're in for a, a tough fight. You know, you're not going to be able to say that it was organic. So yeah, atheists have had some, some difficulty. Uh, which I guess um, leads me to the next question, because I noticed that with a lot of the you know, different conspiracy theories out there, like the young Earth creationists or ancient aliens or hollow Earth theory, it does seem to be a lot of the theories do seem to be geocentric. 
And normally started by religious individuals who either read the Torah, Bible, or Quran uh, literally. Um, it, are you religious yourself, and has your faith kind of help, uh, like inspired you to look at the flat Earth, or do you think your faith has really nothing to do with looking into uh, the flat Earth itself? Uh, kind of the reverse of that. So. I was raised a born-again Christian, evangelical. Church wasn't just a Sunday thing. There was vacation Bible school and youth group and Camp Malibu and, and all that fun stuff. And because I grew up on an island up here in the Northwest. And so I was very sheltered. And then when I went to university, I realized there was more than one religion. And there was the world was much more complicated than I thought it was initially. And so I kind of fell away from the whole religious side of things for years. And then when I got an attack, it made it even worse. Especially if you get into <laughs> to science fiction, you know, you you realize that, I mean, the whole God concept kind of falls away pretty quickly. And then when I got into Flat Earth, it pulled me back into spirituality. Not that I was going to church every Sunday, again, but it definitely, any doubts I had about some sort of creator, and I'm not going to be arrogant enough to, to name him, uh, that that was I mean and that that happens with a lot of people at least half of our community at least in the United States are strong Christians and I, I won't give out the name but there was uh, but several Christian people in our community strong prominent Christian members have said I have never seen uh, over the years I've never seen a tool meaning flat earth bring more mm -hmm. so many people back into spirituality than than this nothing nothing can, can, even comes close because of its its default aspect which is if it was created hmm. well then there's some sort of creator okay um yeah that's that, that i i think that kind of makes sense that if the earth is so i guess because there, there are a bunch of different um flat earth theories out there obviously you have one specific view yeah. Um, and there, I, I've, I've seen atheist flat earthers as well as, um, I guess, Islamic flat earthers as well. So just like a wide range and each of them have a different one. I think I've seen some think that the flat earth is more of just a natural concept of what the world is. Right. While it seems like, uh, I think your, your view is more of an artificial construct. Is that correct? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, walls, floor, ceiling, uh, no different really than a snow globe or a planetarium or a terrarium. Uh, it has all the earmarks of it. And I mean, again, not to get into too deep, but, uh, if, if it's enclosed, then, there is a high degree of probability that it is simulated in nature. And by that, I mean that mm. God or whoever created this place is a, is a programmer uh, because there's too, okay. there's too many things. I mean, even, even your science junkies, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Elon Musk, uh, lots of people in, in the quantum physics world will tell you, it's like, yeah, it really has the earmarks of some sort of simulation. And why should that surprise anybody? I mean, the, the goal of science and entertainment and the military is to create their own simulation. We've been striving for the, the virtual reality, which can convince anyone that, you know, that they're not in the world that they think they're in. That's, that's what everybody's been gunning for for the last 15 years. Yeah. Well, it kind of leads into like the Russian nesting doll situation where it's like, are the people who built our simulation, are they themselves in a, their own simulation, which themselves are in the largest right. simulation, which, right. are, you know, which, the largest simulation. which so. is of course the, um, uh, the 13th floor uh, argument, which is the, uh, you know, the movie from the late nineties, which was that mm -hmm. we, that we, when we build our simulation, I mean, I don't think we're going to be allowed to do that. I think that mm -hmm. I've, I've been a believer. I'm a big science fiction guy anyway. And I think that, that that particular story won't be allowed, meaning we will not be able to build a simulation that will fool people ourselves because that then makes our reality worthless. Meaning it, it's affected mm -hmm. with, I'll, I'll use a quote real quick, which was, it was the creator of Dilbert, a comic strip, who, who really insightful guy who wrote a forward to a book. And he and this was back in the, the 80s when he wrote this. He said, the last invention we'll ever make is the holodeck, you know, like from Star Trek Next Gen. Hmm. He goes, because once that's made, nobody will want to do anything. All they'll care, care about is paying just making just enough money to pay for the holodeck. It's all they'll care about and motivation will flag and the civilization will collapse 
And I said, yeah. And back then, I didn't really understand it. It wasn't until the 90s when I really started started getting into the whole gaming thing. I was going, oh, wow, he's absolutely right. Because people are, for lack of a better, better word, lazy. Yeah, I was I was thinking of a similar situation. Like once a Ready Player One situation happens where yeah. everyone can connect them to their own VR, create their own world, look exactly like their ideal selves, whether right. that's, you know, uh, yeah, and that's, you know uh, a god or... Yeah, they, yeah they will, and that's they will, all they will, anyone did. That's all. Everyone was jacked into this thing all the time. And it's not the first time. I mean, Ready, Ready Player One, of course, didn't, you know, didn't create this theory from anywhere. This theory has been talked about yeah. for a long, long time. There was a book, um, uh, uh, the the initial movie. Okay, so real real quick, a little history of this. So the movie uh, 13th Floor, which was in the late 90s, mm-hmm. was actually a remake of a German film in the 70s called uh, World on a Wire. And that and that was mm-hmm. that was in the mid seventies in Germany, and you can still find it today. I mean, it's it's dubbed or I say it's subtitled, but it's fascinating. And you imagine trying to explain a, a computer simulation in the seventies, right? And that would book yeah. that that particular movie was based on a sixties book called Simulcron Three. You know that name, Simulcron, part of the word simulation. And we've been no no they ever since the first computers were even uh, created people were we the scientists know knew computer scientists knew that that's what we'd be striving for why wouldn't we oh oh yeah that's that's very true and the point that you bring up that it's these are remakes of remakes of even older ideas is very very true especially like most people think oh the Matrix is the one that brought up all these new ideas but no, no. Matrix is actually copied from Grant Morrison's graphic novel The Invisibles. Grant Morrison was inspired by science fiction writer Michael Moorcock, who himself was inspired by even older individuals. So it's just like this idea, these ideas have even been going on for, I would even say, uh, the um, H.G. Wells, uh, Jules Verne era. Because oh, yeah. You can even trace a lot of these modern science fiction theories back to the works of Jules Verne. Yeah, yeah. You don't need, uh, it was only the tech that, that allowed us to realize that it was physically possible to do it before that i mean what we're really talking about here is dreams within dreams which is fantasies yeah. within fantasies how do you know you're not in somebody else's dream this is something that's been talked about for a long 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 time but when we started building our own simulations with machines when you could graphically put it on a screen and you know because a, a picture is worth a thousand words once you could put that on a screen that's when things started to change uh, and not uh, to use it real quick for anyone that might might listen to this, um, the big thing, which w- amazingly, which we figured out was the double slit experiment and not the old Thomas Young experiment from hundreds of years ago. The one that was done not even 20 years ago, the single electron gun experiment, which basically says that nothing exists unless a human being is looking at it. And you're saying, okay, well, what does that to do with simulations? The thing was, once we started building our own simulations, we were using that rule without even thinking about it. It was a, it was an efficiency rule, which is, it, uh, real quick, you'll get this, which is if, um, if you're building a game and you have a mountain off in the distance and you know that character is never, ever going to be on the other side of that mountain, do you build the other side mm-hmm. of the mountain? No, you don't. And nothing yeah. past that. There's nothing literally on the other side of the mountain. So the thing is, and that's done to, to um, make it more efficient, to save computer power. That's all the reason we do it. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is the double slit experiment is doing that here in our world. So if, if that, I mean, it's, it's almost identical to what we're doing in our own machine worlds. So if those two are identical, where are we exactly? You, you can't tell me that, oh, yeah, this reality yeah. is absolutely what, what science says it is. No, science now knows that, but, but they can't really go to the public and say that because it uh, breaks everything down. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, it actually just reminded me of the uh, fantastic Doctor Who episode, the one with Peter Capaldi, I think it was called Extremis, which dealt with that exact idea. Yeah. <laughs> that the Vatican had a secret text that um, basically said our, our world is a shadow world and of course, the Vatican people back in the ancient period didn't understand it. And when Capaldi's doctor read the text, he realized, oh, wait, that means we're in the computer simulation. And um, the interesting thing, how the, the world was projected in this Doctor Who episode, they would only build everything past the projection. They won't build anything 
behind the projection. Yep. And that's how the characters figured out they were in the simulation because if they put their hand behind the projection, all of a sudden their hand disappears because why would you build something behind the projection itself? Exactly. Um, it is, and, it, there's, yeah. There are some laws that do not change, and that is you, you, people don't get it because you, you got to play. Unfortunately, you do have to know a little bit about software development to, to fully understand it, and that's not easy. Uh, but you got to remember the virtual worlds that we're playing in games. I don't care if it's on an Xbox or a PC or your phone. They are paper thin, absolutely paper thin, <laughs> meaning that wall looks absolutely you know, solid, right? But if you look behind it, you just turn clipping off, you look behind it, it is millimeters thin. There is, <laughs> but it looks, you know, we're, we, again, to steal a line from the Truman Show, we believe the world that it's presented to us. And when I say God is a programmer, I'm not trying to belittle God or put God into our sort of concept, but it's like, come on, before we were programmers, God... <laughs> Back in the day, they always thought that God worked with a with a divine hammer and chisel, and then we got better <laughs> tools, right? And then finally, it's like we didn't invent code, right? We we it was inspired by something else, probably the the, yeah. the code of the real world, which is where the whole Matrix. I mean, I love the fact that people enjoyed the Matrix trilogy, but most of them still don't get the overall um, concept. Of it, which is how you know how they 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 see it as entertainment, but very few people actually relay it to our world. It's amazing. Yeah, but I, I think I have. The, I think the issue with that is because I actually so I know the original source of the Matrix was Grant Morrison's graphic novel The Invisibles, which the Wachowski brothers uh, never admitted to, even though it's right there. They obviously copied it. And in the original graphic novel, he actually goes more to detail with that because that graphic novel was written around his experience trying to break through the reality. Uh, though, you know, Grant Morrison's a little bit of a interesting figure. He had a, um, I think he said he had a delusion when he was in Kathmandu where um, aliens <laughs> showed him the concept of reality. But then that's when he realized, like, what he can kind of change the code within the reality around him. So, for example, when he was writing the book that inspired the Matrix, The Invisibles, he had a character who was based on him get shot in the stomach and start slowly dying. And around the same time after that comic book was published, he ended up getting, like, a stomach cancer in the exact same place where his character was shot and was slowly dying. So he basically had to write the next issue where he hoped all his readers would send, you know, positive vibes within the atmosphere that he would heal up and his character would heal up. And right afterwards, his, as he claimed that his cancer would disappear. Huh. Um, so the Invisibles was first around his personal experience trying to, like, break through this reality. And I think the when the Matrix adapted it, they just kind of watered it down to the generic math, right. uh, what the masses were like. Yeah, I can see that. Which, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Well, as as a creator and artist myself, um, uh, I like to picture myself when I when I create my own world. I sometimes like to picture what type, what can I put in my world that is unique, or what should I draw from actual reality. So, assuming I'm a creator of a flat Earth uh, dome simula some simulation myself, right. um, I, I'm actually curious what your what your theory is behind it. Do you believe that in in not in this current uh, reality, but maybe outside there are actually spherical planets that operate around this ball of gravity that orbit nope. stars. Nope. Or do you think it's just this, this very, very creative programmer just that let's just make this on the screen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, well, I mean, like, I'd like to think first off that it, that it wasn't just unique, that this particular structure <laughs> is, is not just a, it's not a one-off. Uh, I mean, well, come on, let's face it. Uh, we're not the first people to rent this apartment. There are civilizations that have yeah. come and gone through this world that are far, far older than us. I mean, whether it's the sunken cities off of Japan or the sunken cities off of India or Bimini Road or the Bodicean pyramids or the real pyramids. Take a pick. There's a lot of stuff that's been yeah. that's, that's already happened. We've only been in here 5,000 years, roughly. Our civilization, unbroken, only goes back 5,000 years, which seems like a long time, but not really. Um, when it comes to what's outside of this, <sighs> Again, could it be that this particular reality is just a um, is just a simulation in a in a vast grid of of other simulations? Yeah, possibly. Uh, what I'd like to think is that outside of this world is an unlimited universe, and by that I mean, for whatever reason, and it was something I'd, I'd written about. Oh, wow, long twenty years ago at least called static world theory, which was what's interesting about this world is it's ninety nine point nine percent conflict. 
And remember, it doesn't matter how rich, how powerful, how beautiful, how talented you are. There is always something to complain about, bitterly complain about. Mm -hmm. uh, no one, their bliss is almost, it's so elusive to find here. It, it, I don't care if you're a rock star or a movie star or if you, you know, you're a trust fund child with a billion dollars in the bank. You are going to complain about things. Why? Why is that? I, I think that's what this world is. I think it's perspective, which is you're mm. here to gain per more perspective. To, you don't, it kind of it goes into dualism, uh, which yeah. is you can't appreciate things without, uh, without seeing the opposites. Hot without cold, pain without pleasure, conflict without no conflict or very, very much reduced conflict. And that's what I think we are here. I think we're here to to appreciate what the infinite is outside of here. It's, it seems like we're in here a long time and, you know, time drags and we, you know, to use the line from the matrix, you know, human beings seem to define the reality through misery and suffering. And that's very true. Uh, we, we yeah. just go, we, we complain from one day to the next, you know, our, our happiness is in very, very small doses here. And I think that's deliberate. So outside of this place, I think it's the unlimited universe. And this, okay. this particular place that we're in right now is just a school. That's all it really is. It doesn't feel like entertainment. It doesn't feel like a prison. It feels like school to me anyway. Oops, sorry. Looks like you cut off. Oh, I'm sorry. Where did I leave off? Um, you said it seems deliberate. Oh, it seemed deliberate. Um, this place seems like a school. More, more than anything, uh, not, not, not a prison, not entertainment. Because if it was entertainment, people, a lot more people would be having fun here, and they're not. Most people are not yeah. having fun. If it was a prison, well, it doesn't really feel like a prison. I mean, it's not that miserable. I mean, there's some really, really it's a really nice prison. It's there are some beautiful places. Uh, it feels like you're here to learn something, and uh, which is kind of a yeah. Middle... So, so it's like training for another level, higher level. You're yeah, saying. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. That, that is interesting because I, I, I did grow up in a religious Taoist family and uh, there are some um, in the Taoist faith that actually believe that, that there are <coughs> layers to the dimensional realities and you have to learn at a certain level to improve before you could advance and reincarnate to the next level. Um, and I, I, I wasn't raised in this specifically specific branch of uh, Taoism, but I do know that there are some Chinese folk religions that actually do also ascribe to the flat earth. Um, of course, the uh, famously, the um, you know, earth is represented by a square within circular heaven. Um, so it, like these, these ideas are, you know, kind of old as well uh, and connect back to a lot of ancient uh, religions that have been around for a while now. So even it's, Everyone's surprised that's coming back in a modern way, but it's like, no, if you actually look outside the first world, there's a lot of people of different faiths um, that actually still subscribe to this idea of a flat earth. Oh, yeah. I, and I, I think it was deliberate. I mean, get to remember the, all the old cultures, and I, I know people keep pointing to the Greeks. No, the Greeks knew. It's like, well, every fine, screw the Greeks. Everybody else <laughs> drew, drew the same thing. Uh, it's part of the speech I'm doing this year, which is, I don't care what culture it was. They all drew the same image, some sort of enclosed world. We, you know, and why they would always think this because the stars moved at night. You know, if you do time lapse yeah. of, of the stars moving. It's like, okay, the stars are moving across the sky. We're sitting still. Therefore, the stars are just some tapestry. And then, and I do think it was deliberate. I think whoever built this place put this mechanism in, which was, once we started getting closer to having technology to figure our world out, you might want to think about changing the world, at least the view of the world, because mm -hmm. otherwise people are going to look for it. Uh, if, they, if they're told there's a fence all the way up until 500 years ago, people go, oh, yeah, the edge of the world, the edge of the world. We all knew there was an edge of the world. And then all of a sudden, 500 years ago, no, there is no edge of the world. The, it's gone. There, mm -hmm. is, there is no fence. That part is genius, which is... You won't, people won't look for a fence if they're told it's not there. If the fence is invisible, it's like, like any hologram, right? If you, if you don't know if it's a wall and then you put a hologram over the front, the, the front of that thing and makes it look like, oh, it just goes off in the distance forever. Lots of people are going to be like, ah, I'm not going down there. It's too far. So having people, you know, the, the fence idea was, was good because once again, remember, we only had the technology to explore this place. Only for about mm -hmm. what sixty years? That's it. That's all we you know. Out of all the th thousands of years we've been around here, we only have the technology to even 
attempt to figure out what this world was for 60 years. So having, yeah. but before that was interesting because science said that, no, 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 it's a globe for at least the last 500 years. So how did, why, why were they saying that if they couldn't actually see it for themselves? Like, oh, mathematics. It's like, well, yeah, but mathematics isn't going to save you here. Eventually you have to go up and take the image. You have to take the picture and okay. What happens when they start with their rocket program and things go badly? What if, what if you got up there and you told, and all of a sudden you saw it and it wasn't what? you've been telling people for the last 500 years, would you tell the population? No, no, you wouldn't. Uh, there's lots of people say, well, no, the people have a right to know. And I'd tell them, it's like, no, you wouldn't. You'd sit down with your advisors and they would say, okay, what's the worst that could possibly happen? And then like in the clues, you rattle off all these things about potential chaos yeah. and destruction. And of course, science basically taking punches in the stomach for ever. It'd, it'd be tough to do. Sorry. Anyway, I ramble. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, it's good you brought that up because I remember you mentioning it on the uh, on some other podcast, specifically with uh, Ono Grok and Kerry, that you were talking about how during the Cold War, um, both the Americans and the Soviets on the outside, they kind of looked like they were enemies, but on the inside, they were behind trying to, you know, cover up the um, the flat earth right. uh, to the point that uh, they they eventually funneled everything onto NASA because they didn't want the Soviets to accidentally screw up with their interpretations of the moon landing. Um, I, I, this, now, this is the hard one to kind of jump over for me, because on, on one hand, I could definitely see why groups would want to go against the norm and hold knowledge back because they don't want the chaos. Right. But on the other hand, it, it does seem like a bit uh, I'm like if 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 these different governments did realize that there is a great program or do, uh, wouldn't it be more feasible that they would want to unite and try to see, okay, we're, we, it looks like we're in assimilation. Why are we in assimilation? Let's, let's put our forces together and try to either break out assimilation or. It's, uh, a, it's, a, nice, program it, it's or, a nice idea on your part and it is yeah. noble mm -hmm. for you to suggest such a thing. But there's one thing I have learned uh, about, again, here's a line from matrix men in power. All they care about is more power, mm -hmm. which is you can't. Oh, let's use the UFO thing with the Air Force. Yeah. Uh, everybody knows there's UFOs flying around. They've been flying around for a long, long time. You know, way before we had photographs and way before Roswell, UFOs have been flying around. And the thing, the, the one thing they always have in common is whatever's flying around up there is better than us. They're, whatever those yeah. vehicles are, they are way better than our airplanes far far advanced they're using some sort of unified field engine we all know that uh they don't use a just a, a you know thrust and lift engine and here's the thing the air force can never admit this because you can't mm -hmm. be you can't rule the skies if you don't rule the skies you know what i mean uh okay. you can't be the yeah. highest you can't be the highest power if you're not the highest power it's tough to, it undermines your authority if all of a sudden you stand, if someone is standing over your shoulder that's way bigger than you. And by that, I mean the governments of this world. The governments of this world have, have tried very, they've done very well to, to keep the population in check and, and create a, a system of control that's got multiple facets and, and overlapping angles, and it works very, very well. To all of a sudden say that, oh, by the way, there's a power that's way, way bigger than us. We have absolutely no control over it, uh, and and they made you. Would all of a sudden give the religious world a lot more credibility? And there's a lot of people. Remember, a new religion would form almost immediately if that happened. Yeah. Even if you didn't have the answers, so it's like okay, and we can't talk to them. It's like why should we have? To, why should we answer to you? I don't care about you anymore. I care about the the whoever built this place, whoever built that wall behind you. I care about them. That's all I care about. And this would severely undermine any authority where people would, they would not necessarily rebel, but they wouldn't listen quite as intently. And the fear that you strike into their heart, yeah, that wouldn't be there anymore. Okay. Uh, there's a, And a lot of it would be based on faith. So, hey, look, I, I, aside, <laughs> aside from the academic consequences and the world market economic consequences, the spiritual side of things would be tough. Look, people don't people in power don't make those sort of risks they they don't yeah. they they would sit down and again they would sit in a room it's like what's the worst that could happen and they just rattle off things for about 15 minutes and they'd realize yeah we can't tell people until we're ready to tell them 
until we're ready to spin it in a way, you know, the, the old story from movies. It's like until we are w a way to disseminate it to the public in a way which we think is appropriate. Uh, the, an old, uh, let me end it with this. The, there's a line from FDR, uh, our, one of our older presidents, who said, only tell the public as much truth as they can handle. That's it. And it was very interesting that he would say that, considering he was the guy that, uh, you know, probably covered up the whole Pearl Harbor thing. Yeah. So. Hmm. Okay. Um, actually, I want to see how much time you might actually have left, because it's actually a very interesting conversation. No, no like I'll, talk you, with, I'll talk you with you for a little while longer. Sure. We're fine. Okay. Um, yeah, because I, okay, so talking about that global government or the government's trying to control things, I've also heard other flat earthers talk about how it was the Vatican that was the first to kind of also cover it up, oh. which I guess on one end would kind of make sense because if a new religion formed up around this, uh, like you were saying, new religions might form up and might undermine the, you know, the Vatican religion. But on the other hand, I could also see people rushing back to, yeah, yeah, yeah. End, it, like, but, do you subscribe uh, to that? I don't know if they'd take the risk either. It's a good point, which is... Yeah. I, now, do I think the Vatican... I mean, come on. I, it, I, it's it's an argument which I hate getting into because people will say, oh, you know, if you gave a conspiracy person, okay, give me your top 20 in order of importance, uh, the most powerful <laughs> secret groups in the world, right? And people would just start rattling them off. The Vatican, the Bilderbergs, the Trilateral Commission, the Wh the Masons, the Jesuits, the, the Illuminati, <laughs> the Illuminati, the Rothschilds, and so on, a Jewish cabal. This goes on and on and on. And people have arguments over who is has the, the pecking order here. It doesn't matter because the first rule of power has never changed, and that is those with the true power stay hidden, meaning you don't know their name, you don't know their group, they don't take any chances, and they never it is it, the first rule of power, along with staying hidden, is um, never put yourself in a position of being overthrown. The public cannot take you down if they don't know who you are. And by that meaning, if they don't know you exist at all, there is no target for them to, to go after. So, yeah, but when people say, oh, it was the Vatican, they were the, the lead in this, it's like, come on. It could have been a why, why not just say the Illuminati and why not, and it's it's meant it's it's kind of a shell game at that point where people are just dancing around trying to figure out who's the, the biggest villain. And truthfully, the biggest villain is the puppet master you don't see. And that's done deliberately. It's it's the curse and the blessing of being the ultimate power in our civilization, which is you can have the ultimate power, but you can't be public about it. Meaning you can't be yeah. you can't be popular. You can't come out and say I'm the ultimate power, because and and have people admire you because at the same time you're also uh, made vulnerable by saying that. So you, you're, you're you, made a target. The, the ultimate guy, yeah, yeah. The ultimate guy. The ultimate po power could be walking past you in a Walmart store, rock, walk right up to you. You wouldn't know who he was. The chances are he's probably not going to be in a Walmart store, but you never know. Yeah, I, you, yeah, you make a very, very good point. I think most that's where most cons other conspiracy uh, theories for their various other theories kind of fall short. Hmm. The people in power would not be like the George Soros or the people no. who are out publicly. These would be people behind the scenes controlling the puppets. In fact, they would be they would be i would say they would be at a level where even money doesn't concern them anymore like they would be at a point where they are past materialistic things it would be just power and control you, you maybe even to the point where they have so much power they'll be bored and would just want to have little games with each other there you go well okay you're a comic book guy I, you probably read some of the um uh either planetary or authority you ever read those yes i have okay perfect yes. uh there was something in the authority um uh, I'm just looking at one of the books right now because I used to own a comic book shop years and years ago, um, <laughs> which was uh, the, the people with and I don't know if it was the 15 digit bank accounts or basically the, the numbers were so high that it was irrelevant. They were never yeah. going to run out of money because the money just kept making money on a regular basis that, that money had no meaning to them. And so these people, yeah, of course, we've heard about the, whenever I see a story on the news, it's like, oh yeah, this is the, the currently the, the highest billionaire in the world. It's like, no, it's not. It's the highest public billionaire <laughs> in the world. Bill, Bill Gates has billions of dollars. He is not nearly, yeah, he's in the top 1%, but he's not even in the top 10 of the, whoever these people are. Uh, there's people that make huge amounts of money way before the stock market was even a thing. 
These are the people that had the money back when, back when. And be said, well, okay, like the Rothschilds. It's like, yeah, okay, I know the Rothschilds story. And yes, they made a lot of money. But I'm talking about people that have been, that their families have been going through time, basically, just, just creating countries and building empires. And like you said, playing games, more or less. Yeah. So. So kind of like a more hidden Medici, like you're yeah. Be saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. So, so you do believe that this, I guess, um, like, I, I, I don't want to like assume that you, I don't want to group you in with the, you know, the people who believe in like the reptilian. No, no, stuff, that's fine. Obviously yeah, you I've, thought, got, I've got you, an opinion you, on all of them. So go ahead. You, you definitely, you definitely are taking this much deeper than what the super, the superficial layer that most other, uh, the, uh, conspiracy theorists would go to. Um, and I'm not even using conspiracy theorists as a derogatory term because it's, it's like, it's, uh, you are, you are definitely looking at this from a higher level but do you actually think that the i guess this group that's in charge whether cabal or yeah. puppet masters are in charge have they been around since like do you think they're working with the programmers or they were the first to realize the programmers then get power from that or do you think they're more of a recent creation maybe like cold post world war one cold war creation well i mean do I think they knew? Uh, it was an argument I threw out there a long time ago, which was, let's yeah. say you're the king of France in 1500, right? And mm -hmm. you find out what the world really looks like. What can you do with it? Yeah. There's nothing you can do with it. You don't have the technology to exploit it. Not really. Now, you can use it to, like, <laughs> make sure religions are doing this and that and, and, and turning cultures a certain way. But you don't know for sure. I don't even think... And something I've, I've it's interesting that you bring that up because I don't think even our best and brightest knew for sure until 1960. Mm. I really don't. Meaning it was just it was kind of like the Lord of the Rings things. It was myth and legend. That's all it was until you see the ring in action. Come on. It's just a story, which I also think yeah. the ring of power actually is a real thing. But it's a whole other thing. <laughs> uh, but until you go, I mean, I, that's why I think when they, what happened was in uh, 1926, Admiral Byrd goes to the North Pole and he finds something. And whatever it is, spooked him a lot. You know, but remember, it was 1926. Yeah. Again, it barely had radio in 1926. And so you send him out to, it's like, okay, if this is it, then maybe the maps are right. Let's just go out and start start flying around in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. You know, flying out over the ice. And so you're flying over the ice for the better part of 30 years. And at some point, you almost give up. 1954, it was like they gave up. They, he goes on television. And he says, eh, it's just a big continent. We're going to, it's made out of money. Let's just go down there and start tearing this thing up. And of course, that's Murphy's Law. And then it's like, okay, here's the outer marker. Then, yes, that's when everything changed. That's when it's like, okay, yeah. we got to keep this. They, whatever last grasp they had on civilization in terms of control, that this was the final act, which is okay. We got to keep this thing. We, we got to keep this thing going for as long as we can. We got to build an infrastructure. So when it comes out, whatever we tell the people, that's what's going to be the story. We, everyone's going to be on the same page. And the infrastructure they built leading up to now, 2019, is exactly that which is look you got high speed internet social media six billion smartphones whatever message you push out there to the world basically everyone's got the same story in 30 minutes so what i'm more curious about what you said kind of thinking higher level here is whatever story yeah. they're going to push out what what do you tell the people because you can't just tell them yeah. that the earth is flat you can't, you can't just do that because one, there'd be a massive series of class action lawsuits, the world markets, all that, all that yeah. stuff. So you kind of tie it in with something else, which is what other conspiracy people, oh, you're going to tie it in with a fake alien invasion or a fake celestial event or some sort of a revelation of a new, of an older civilization. I mean, come on, all you need really at this point is have some giant golden spaceship land, I don't know, in Europe. It doesn't have to be in the U.S., uh, or somewhere, yeah. somewhere quietly, whoever, whoever shows up has got to be better looking than us. It's one of the rules. And then they, uh, they come out and they say, well, yes, just so you know, we, we built this world. Or you can make up a fake thing where you say, your world's yeah. in danger. We've got to evacuate you. And then it's like, oh, yeah, everyone get on the ships. And then you go on the ships and you can, do, you can make up any story you want. But you can't just say it's got to be tied in with, with that. 
it one way or the other. I yeah. I think I think flat earth is just the framework. It is just the literally the the the, the frame around a tapas a canvas that we haven't seen yet. Without the flat flat earth is the yeah. is the open minded thing. It opens people's minds up to other concepts. And I've seen that yeah. basically forever, which is if you get if you can understand flat earth, you can understand anything. And once you have the flat earth then you can you can throw something at them. It's even bigger. I, I it's something I mentioned. I haven't talked about it probably in at least a year. Which is in a boxing reference, flat Earth would be like the left jab before the right hook. And the question is, hmm. what's bigger than flat Earth? There's only a couple things that you could even introduce that yeah. would be bigger. One would be an advanced civilization that we don't we've never heard of yet, and they just show up, or some sort of big religious celestial event. Is one of the only there's only a couple things left, so sorry, hmm. I get excited. No, um, no, I, I'm actually happy you brought that topic of uh, when you know you get into flat earth, think open your mind to other things, and you also brought up uh, Admiral uh, Bird, Bird yeah. Yeah. which which was a uh, which is interesting because my friend, my Seattle friend who was watching documentary with me, he brought up an interesting point that both uh, flat earthers and the hollow earthers use Admiral Byrd as kind of one of their starting points for forming their well, own that, That's how I got into but, it. That's how I got into yeah. Flat Earth was through Hollow Earth. I, I, looked, I was a yeah. Hollow Earth guy, and I just happened to be researching Admiral Byrd, and then I was just kind of, on a side note, I was looking at Flat Earth, and then I realized almost everybody in the Hollow Earth knows the story of 1926 where he goes to the North Pole, right? But everyone mm -hmm. forgets that after 1926, he spent the rest of his life flying in circles in Antarctica. But it didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. It's like, what? You'd think the guy is like journey to the center of the earth, that whole thing. Why wouldn't you just keep going to the North Pole over and over and over again? And it, he did the exact opposite. They sent him the in the other direction and they kept him out there. And uh, yeah, but your yeah. hollow earth and flat earth. Yep. Absolutely tied together. Because, yeah, because it's interesting. Yeah, they uh, both, yeah, like you were saying, both hollow earth and flat earth will kind of use the same sources, but come to different conclusions. Because I guess there could technically be a flat hollow earth, but. Well, no, you can, you can do the two. You, they'll dovetail in just fine. Separate, yeah. You got to remember the <laughs> most of our civilization lives. I mean, 90 something percent of our civilization lives between sea level and 5,000 feet. That's it. Uh, okay. And so if you had a cave. It was that you know if there was a hollow place underneath this that was even ten miles high, I mean that's ten miles high. That's that's uh, most commercial airlines don't even go ten miles high. I mean you could build up very easily. In fact, if you want to go take it even further, who's to say that we aren't in some sort of hollow earth scenario right now? Hmm. If the cave, if the cave, yeah, was, if the cave was only a hundred miles yeah. high, that's easy and that's tiny. That's a that's not much of a dome at all. That, that is true because I know even um, I know there were even some Nazis who actually believed they were inside the uh, hollow earth to the point that they believed that they point the telescope up at the sky they could actually see uh, London because they believed they were inside a uh, hollow sphere. So oh, he points gotcha, up at gotcha, the sky yeah. at the horizon. Well, no, yeah, okay. Was, the it was, it was the hollow earth theory. I'm talking about is is more of a literally yeah. just a, a like a dome inside a cave. Uh, where is yeah, the... I, I understand. What, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> that the dome is essentially the cave of the uh, Earth. Yeah, right, understand. right. Whereas the the most the the hollow Earth theory, which a lot of people think about, it, is uh, kind of like the version of a, a Dyson sphere. Uh, the whole, yeah. you know, the, the the fact that you can live on the inside of a sphere, which I suppose you could if there was space, but that, mm -hmm. we'll get into a whole other thing. Okay. Well, it, it's interesting. You were able to reconcile both the, uh, I guess, the. Um, flat earth and hollow earth together because i know a lot of people once again to the conspiracies once you know the door opens for conspiracies they normally have to pick one side or the other because uh, there's a lot of different conflicting like um ancient aliens might conflict with the phantom time hypothesis which might conflict with you know fake moon landings right. which might conflict with the expanding earth theory for example um and it's it, or the young earth uh, might conflict to some other stuff so all these different theories they 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 can't all fit together nicely but it seems that they will have to explain like create like their own new definitions for gravity or physics to try to explain a theory and it works perfectly but it might not fit with the other theories so for example um at emerald city comic-con um 
my friend and I, we got to chat with uh, the comic creator, Neil Adams, a uh, fantastic guy. Uh, he was in the middle of, you know, drawing and signing. And once we, because Neil Adams is a big proponent of the growing Earth theory, or as it's more commonly known, the expanding Earth theory. Right. And once we asked him about it, he like just put his pen down and went on like a, a half hour lecture <laughs> just for us on the, on the expanding Earth. And at first it does sound a little bit crazy, but once you hear his perspective he throws us his own science and now he has to make up his own entire new like physics would not work in this current our current concept of physics would not work in his theory so he created this entire new version of physics which actually in the, his worldview does work but then it would not it would not like go along with the other theories like the hollow earth and flat earth and young earth so it, 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 it's uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what i'm trying to get but it's it's like there's all these other theories out there. They have their own specific worldview, but their worldview will not, it would mean completely erasing all the science, uh, what we know of science, and putting on their new version of science to explain things. And it might not go along with the other conspiracy theory that has to, like, for example, I, I guess some flat earthers might have to change the definition of gravity to... Um, something else that might not go along with uh, new Adams expanding earth theory of gravity. Right, um, right. So how does the, how, how is this big community that wants to be open-minded and once, you know, they have a gateway to look into one theory, try to you know, reconcile all these different ones and not try to push them down saying, Oh, our theory is better than yours. So. Most of them. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 I do. I do. Most of them yeah, bend, okay. in, bend in pretty well. Um, there are very few okay. theories that don't dovetail into flat earth. Um, expanding earth theory would be one, but we would throw that out almost instantly because you're talking about a sphere. Mm -hmm. Anything. In fact, the only cons well, I, I don't even call it a conspiracy. As far as all the conspiracies are out there, there's only one that ever had a problem with flat Earth that I've seen in the last four years, and that was uh, Richard Hoagland's secret space program, which is, he said, you know, there's already mm -hmm. millions of people living on the moon and hundreds of thousands of people living on Mars and all that. And, in fact, he was supposed to debate me a couple of years ago, and he, and he, um, <laughs> he bailed. He, he wouldn't do it because he realized that there was going to be a lot of problems because the two are absolutely incompatible. There can't, be two, there can't be millions of people living on the moon if you can't land on the moon at all. And yeah. so, and the secret space program also had a problem with ours in that, uh, because we said, look, it took them, it took the United States government 43 years to take the second blue marble shot of the world, which was absolutely true. They took the first one in 72 and the second one in, in 2015. So if you had a secret space program, you don't have to show what the spaceship is. All you have to do is take the picture of the earth. So are you telling me that not only did the existing space program not take any shots of the Earth, but the secret space program didn't take any shots either? And that's just sorry, it's it's too far. It's too far of a stretch. Everything else, though, because it's because those conspiracies are inside flat Earth, work great. If you're yeah. inside the dome, come on, it's, it, whatever's happening on the sound stage still works. I don't care if it's a small conspiracy like JFK or Pearl Harbor or Boston bombing or Sandy Hook or vaccinations or whatever, they all exist inside of Flat Earth. So the there are no, it, look, I know conspiracies about as well as anyone. Other than the secret space program, there is no other conspiracy out there that damages the Flat Earth so much. I mean, in expanding Earth, that's, I don't even call it a conspiracy. That's more of just a alternating view of cosmology which yeah. sorry just doesn't have the membership there's just not enough people to yeah in fact he i would i would expect that if he sunk his teeth into flat earth that he would eventually uh see it more probable than uh the heliocentric model so. hmm. yeah because it's um specifically with new adams i was actually i thought his theory was interesting in the sense that it wasn't a geocentric theory because he thought all planets were expanding um right. he didn't believe he thinks that there was that one miracle at the beginning he doesn't think that there's consistent miracles or divine intervention he just thinks there is that one big bang and that's it um but i i guess like because on one hand you said once you accept the flat earth theory then it's easier to accept all these other um kind of crazy and fringe yeah, ideas but on the other hand, don't you think it's also a slippery slope to then buying really, really crazy stuff, you know, like 
Sandy Hook and all the other stuff. Like they're they're well, it's, okay. it, no, it, no, it no, is no. kind of like a slippery slope. Yeah. Sorry, I'm still trying to fight this cold, but you're okay. No worries. Yeah. So no, and that's interesting that you would say that. Uh, and and I don't even mind getting into it. Mo- okay, most people when I when I do interviews, uh, I, when somebody brings up another conspiracy that's not flat Earth, I'll say, just so you know, you brought it up and not me. And I do have a, a, an <laughs> opinion on this. And and you're absolutely right. Once you get into flat Earth, you absolutely have to dust off every conspiracy you ever looked at before and look at it again, uh, wh- regardless if it ties directly to flat Earth, because flat Earth now just opens your mind. It's like, okay, if this is a lie, then potentially everything is a lie. But every other conspiracy, with the exception of this one, was created by man. And sorry, the, the Sandy Hook thing, uh, look, I, I'm a big believer of... Uh, plot holes. I, I, you know media as well as anybody, right? And for me, that's why yeah. they call them plot holes. It's kind of like a boat. If there's too many plot holes, the boat will sink. And then, then the suspension yeah. of disbelief isn't there anymore, and you're not going to believe the story. It's why people walk out of movies. I mean, you know, they, they watch it, and it's like, oh, this is terrible. There's, because there's certain things that just don't make sense in movies because writers are just notoriously lazy. When it comes to Sandy Hook... Uh, and I, I, I'll, I'll tell you three things off the bat, but I'll, I'll give you the first one right away. And I'm not trying to insult anybody. Yeah, I, I just brought it as an example. No, 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 it's good because that was the first thing that came to your mind, which was, you know, the yeah. really crazy stuff like Sandy Hook. It's like, well, it is crazy unless you look at it from a movie standpoint, meaning, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll three quick points real quick. And then, and we can go on to something else, which is I will pay you. A thousand dollars right now if you can show me a 10 second video clip video notice I said video I'm gonna say video one more time video clip of a single child being carried out of that uh, of, of that school single child never happened and say well there why why would there have to be video it's like well no because the traffic copters every operation can be blown in two seconds it devils in the details uh, the traffic copters were there instantly with full tanks of gas. They were bored. It was first thing in the morning. And they hovered and they hovered and they hovered and they hovered. And 600 kids never came out of that building. Not a single one. And and we, it would have taken hours to, to evacuate 600 kids out of that building. It would have taken hours to do. Uh, second would have been Robbie Parker. You, want, you can look this up anytime you want on YouTube. Ty, type in Robbie Parker smiling. And that was 24 hours later, uh, CNN... Uh, a parent of, of a kid, a daughter, supposedly six, supposedly gunned down, smiling, couldn't have been happier, talking with buddies, laughing. He's on camera on CNN, but he didn't realize it was a live feed. And then they bring him up to the podium and then he gets sad and, you know, gets all gets all stuffed up. It's like, really? Because you were just joking with your buddies over there. That guy should have been a freaking wreck. Last but not least, Sandy Hook. Uh, something that's never, ever happened. And if you're a stats guy, I, I know I am. We all know that in war, in any conflict, there's dead and there's wounded. There's dead and there's wounded. And the wounded is always more. 20 dead, 50 wounded. 100 dead, 300 wounded. We all know this. Sandy Hook has what has never happened before or since, uh, a perfect kill ratio. Everybody was dead. Yeah. It didn't, and, I mean, like perfect, like wherever it was, 29 and 0 or something like that. It's never, ever happened in the history of, 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 of armed gunfire when, when you have that many things. We all, look, he squeezed off 150 rounds. Of, of 223 and in a school and ricochets everywhere we're talking about a brick building and it's like basically what you're saying is you got hit in the toe you're dead you got hit in the ear dead get hit in the hand dead nobody survived they got shot come on yeah not not buying it so sandy hook, sandy hook was uh it was just a it was a, it was an, i don't know exactly the reason behind it but it was a bad operation from beginning to end whoever was in charge of that should have been fired or killed anyway sorry there's my okay oh uh, no no i i because I, I i didn't know what your opinion on that was but i was i was trying to think of like a um like a conspiracy that you know is not okay I, okay conspiracy I, I, that I, I don't a good, believe in? a good experience is i saw okay so on the documentary i saw the uh i saw all these attacks on um, how they're saying she's a government show, how, you know, she's transgender and stuff. Oh, Patricia, and yeah. Like, it, it, yeah, Patricia, sorry. Um, but yeah, it, it does seem like it, it does lead rooms to, you know, viciously attack 
personal lives of people and uh, oh, well, yeah, not, I'm yeah. not talking you're, about you're right. it is a, it is a, but conspiracy in general it is you know? a double edged sword it, no question when people get into I mean yeah but heck not just Patricia anyone and part of it has to do with just envy jealousy uh, when you get up to a certain level, I mean, we all do that. I mean, uh, in the social media world, if somebody has more subscribers to you, you, you have this initial reaction of, oh, you know, the, 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 the childhood thing. It's like, you're not so great, right? And, but if you're in the conspiracy world and you've already been open-minded to the whole flat earth thing, oh, it gets way worse. I mean, people throw out the, the worst attacks on people. Uh, and yeah, you're right. It's, it's tough to, to, to deal with because they're so... The conspiracy world will make up anything anyway. You know, they, they, they will make huge leaps of faith and, and they will attack their own, which is why you saw in the documentary that um, the Monty Python uh, reference yeah. and the what I call this the, the clans of the Scottish Highlands, which is, yeah, I mean, we'll, they'll start whacking each other all day long. Now, at the end of the day, they still hate the English, which is on the other side of the field. Yeah. That's their common enemy. That's the only reason mm-hmm. that Flat Earth hasn't torn itself apart is because we have, we have this common foe on the other side. So, and by the mm-hmm. way, there are some conspiracies yeah, because, I don't, I don't yeah. care about. Like, I mean, yeah. like I don't, do I think that Elvis is still alive? No. Uh, do I think yeah, that, obviously, yeah. <laughs> do I think that, um, I mean, I'm trying to think of, are there a lot of conspiracies I don't believe in? I'm not a big believer in clones. That's probably another one I'm not like where it's like oh, like Paul, Paul Paul McCartney was died, but they didn't want to break up the band, so they they got a brought in a clone to just you know yeah. stuff like that. It's like nah, I don't know, it's not really me. I mean, but, I, but, but at the same time, I won't mm, kill, I won't shoot it down that fast. I, yeah. so people will say, oh no. yeah, by the way, Elvis had Bigfoot's baby. I'll, beforehand, I'd be get out of here, right? Nowadays, like you know what, I'll give you a few minutes. What do you got? <laughs> no, 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 but um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, you brought some good points, but I think the point I was trying to get at was w- once, like you were saying, once you become open-minded about flat earth, you can become open-minded about all these other conspiracies, right. which might mean it's a little bit easier to digest the lies, like like we were seeing with the flat earthers attacking each other. Like, I think they were saying yep. that you were uh, an actor for Warner Brothers, for example. Yep. So shouldn't that also open your eyes saying if, if these people are kind of thinking, in, are, are these people joined Flat Earth and now became open-minded, but became open-minded to a point that they're believing things that I know are categorically wrong, shouldn't that maybe, shouldn't that maybe make me think about where we should kind of, not draw the line, but where we should, what areas we should become more skeptical at so we could think more rationally on these point instead of trying to jump in and accept every single theory that's thrown out because i know you would not believe that you are a warner brother actor because that's your life you know yourself right, personally right, right. but everyone else outside how, how do you convince them and tell them hey think rationally think skeptically about this you know it it is what i like to call collateral damage which is you're you're right but there is no solution to it unfortunately uh once you somebody gets that open-minded there, there, it's not that you, you can't do anything to turn it off. So, yeah, when people come at me and say, oh, yeah, he's a... And, in fact, it was part of one of my speeches in Raleigh, which was I gave, you know, a, like 15 different things that I've been accused of. All, of course, which overlap and cancel each other out. You know, I can't be a CIA agent and a Warner Brothers exec and an NSA agent and, you know, all these different disinfo things all simultaneously. It, it's not possible. Uh, but at the same time, because people are open-minded now, uh, you got to take the good with the bad. I, I, I wish mm-hmm. there was a solution to it, but there isn't. There's, I mean, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, for, for lack of a better term. Uh, there's, there's nothing you yeah. can do to stop it. It's, it's all, once it's out there, it's out there. You, there's no, it's like ripping the governor off an engine. Uh, it's... What are you going to do? You can't put a partial governor back on it. Uh, and plus, even if I wanted to come back at him and say, oh, yeah, you know, it'd be hypocritical for me to say that. I want you to believe in Flat Earth, one of the most fringe topics ever in the history of our history. But by the way, don't believe anything bad that was ever said about me. It's like, that, it, it, it'd be said, <laughs> why, well, how could I even say that with a, with a straight face? I, I just tell people, like, look, believe what you want. Uh, but what I tried, what I try to tell people now is I go, 
fine. You don't trust me. And there's a lot of people that don't trust me. I get that. Because for whatever reason, it's like, well, how does he get so many interviews? And how does he, it's like, because I put my phone number out there, but whatever. But I say, if you don't believe me, fine. Are you still in flat earth? Yes. Well, then I don't care. I don't. I, I go, there's plenty of other, there's so many channels out there that you could, you could spend time with. And a lot of people do. So, and then there's other people that get accused of. I mean, that's, again, one of the reasons why Flat Earth keeps growing is that you have options. If you don't believe in Patricia or Bob or Jaron or Nathan or me or all the other, you know, there's always somebody. They always back somebody. I've never, again, Flat Earth has, and this is not an exaggeration, we have a 99% retention rate. Meaning once you get into it, remember what I said about being open-minded, you can't go back. It is the it is a, probably the example of red pill blue pill, which is even if you wanted to take the blue pill, it's not going to do anything to you. you. You're already too far gone. Uh, I thought I thought the the argument with Cipher and the Matrix was silly. It's like really you're going to put in memory blocks and you're going to go back into the back into the Matrix. Why would you go back in forgetting everything you knew? Why don't you just go back in and be the rock star you wanted to be or an actor or whatever you know. Anyway, yeah, you can't you can't go back to the globe even if you wanted to. Now, which is why I don't mind. Yeah. So call me a Warner's Brothers exactly all you want. Okay. Um, well, I guess that actually I, I do want to ask. Uh, I guess maybe finish this off by asking a bit about the behind the curve documentary. Sure. Um, a bit because I, I think that just came out recently and people are kind of curious because I think uh, more mainstream people are now knowing you from the documentary right. as well as your various interviews you've been doing right. now when the director uh daniel when he approached you did he tell you if it was going to be like pro flat earth or like anti flat earth no, or did he, he tell you he, he was just going to he step on the sidelines he said it was going to be int- uh, he said it was going to be neutral daniel and i spent enough okay. time with him over the seven months that we shot that he's a good guy i i'm not going to ever come down on okay. daniel he's a he's a good guy and he wanted it to be a human interest piece, and he wanted... I mean, it was the perfect climate for it, because, you know, we're not judging anybody. Hashtag 2019, all groups matter, that whole thing. And he wanted to wanted to be just about the people of Flat Earth, and he wasn't going to get into the nuts and bolts of it. And for the most part, he was staying on that path until he got to Raleigh, until he got to the conference. And I've heard this now from different groups, National Geographic and other some big podcasts, and especially people in science. And this one scene really bothered him, which was when the 12-year-old kid walked up to the microphone and was asking me questions. Because, you know, the whole the cliche, it's like, think of the children. What about the children? We need to protect the children. And that's yeah. really, that was their stance. was like, okay, we have a responsibility to the children to do something. And he said this in the director's commentary, which was on iTunes. And it didn't surprise me that much, but that's why it got tweaked the way it did, where he would take any shots. But but yet remember, by that time, most of the principal film had already been shot. So he whatever was in the can, whatever he had, whatever he had shot, they were on a limited budget, to say the least. That's what that's what they had to work with. And so that's when they went after Bob and that's when they after Jaron and, you know, like took the, took the shot at me with the green button, which I thought, and even, he even felt badly about that. He told me about that before I first watched it about the green button. He asked me if I minded that he took, he did that. And I was like, no, he didn't. All he had to do was to take out the part, literally the five seconds of me smacking that green button. Cause it didn't work. Cause nothing in the, that NASA place worked. And when it pulled it out, it was it was quite clever, which was, okay, well, if Mark missed the obvious green button, then uh, he misses a lot of obvious things, including that the world is a sphere. And it was it was quite effective. <laughs> and, and the power of editing, people don't know. It is extremely strong. You can do so much in editing that, uh, I mean, again, taking, taking the shot at Bob, uh, making him look like he was hiding something, uh, taking the shot at Jaron, removing almost every aspect of that experiment. Jaron didn't even have line of sight. Of course, he didn't know that until later, but they didn't leave that in there, and he pulled out everything else that he could. Uh, but in the end, I'm sorry, in the end, I thought it was a fair piece. There you go. Okay. Even with all the editing tricks, like you were saying, with the massive buttons, well, and stuff, you thought it was fair. It, it let people feel safe. Remember, I, was, I sat in the film festivals with, with some of the audience, and they didn't know I was there. And hmm. when they watched it, they what Daniel didn't realize was because he was working with the topic for so long, he knew every aspect of the topic. 
But the audiences, most of the audience he was showing these to, they don't know anything about anything. And so literally like the first 20, 25 minutes, people were, weren't even sure that what they were seeing was real. And only then they were engaged. And by the end, they had so many questions. I'll give you a quick uh, thing, which I, which a story I love to tell. Um, one of the, well, the, the main editor for this film, he showed it to a friend of his in LA who didn't know anything about it, right? He just showed him the film because I want you to watch this. I'm not going to tell you what, what it's about. Watch it. At the end, his friend was just blown away. He goes, wow. He goes, what sort of budget did you guys have? He says, what do you mean? He goes, where did you get all these actors? They played it so, <laughs> they played it so deadpan straight. And, and, and his friend goes, no, man, it was real. He goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. And it completely blew his mind. He goes, that thing in Raleigh, that conference, he goes, that happened? That was a real thing? And that's what most people uh, that were out there that watched the film on Netflix. And they'd have been out there for several months already, but I had no idea that Netflix was, was going to generate that much interest. Um, when people saw it, they, that's what they, they had that reaction. All of a sudden, it was like the, 30 minutes in, and I saw this in, firsthand with the crowds, which was they all of a sudden realized there's a part of the internet which they had completely missed. There's this community out there which, is, which exists, and it had been existing for some time, that nobody had even given attention to. And I was like, wait, wait, it's, you know, like walking around a, like a new amusement park that they'd never even knew existed. <laughs> and for a lot of, and, and they had so many questions. And so, yeah, it is the biggest, right now, it is the biggest Trojan, Trojan horse recruiting tool we could have ever asked for. It is, I mean, my email load doubled in a week after the Netflix thing came out. And it hasn't stopped. Okay. I mean, I'm doing, I think I'm doing the Today Show tomorrow, uh, but not in this country, a different one. Uh, I think, Aust Aust is it Australia or New Zealand? I can't remember, <laughs> to be honest. Okay. So so it's definitely, for you, it's been a more positive uh, uh, reaction, even though it oh, yeah, might yeah. have edited I mean, you look, to look like the way. <laughs> it's, it's okay because because the people are overwhelmed with the topic. Yeah, you can take shots. I mean, the, the, the most common one I got was when people were like asking about Jaren's experiment at the end. They knew something was wrong but they couldn't explain what it was because people don't know science. And l let me end with this, uh, which is the, the, big, the biggest reason, this may help you in some way, the biggest reason why Flat Earth has expanded the way it has is because of that. And I knew this right away because people don't know science. The, the saying is, leave science to the scientists. We become so compartmentalized that the average person, they don't want to learn anything. They want to be entertained, which is fine, but there's a problem there. And that is, uh, up until now, science could just say anything they want. People would believe it. It's like, uh, you know, talk about dark matter. Dark matter is an absolute theory, and, and they're preaching it like it's a real thing. People have no idea what, even, what the concept of what dark matter is. But it's even more simple than that. So when I go to anyone and I say, okay, the curvature of the Earth, which was not talked about in the documentary, which was interesting. You thought they would have thrown out some math there, and they didn't. The, the curvature of the Earth is 8 inches per mile, and people are totally with me when I say that. And then I go squared. They glaze every. You ask people, watch, watch what happens to them. They glaze over, and you can see their mind rolling back to eighth grade, or freshman year in high school. It's like they forgot everything about introductory algebra. Forgot everything about it. And if they don't know that, then how in the world can math? When science comes against us, and they use mathematics, I try to tell them, I'm going, you've lost the audience. The average person doesn't know even that formula, eight inches per mile squared. And you're going to quote them geometry. You're going to quote them trig, calculus, quantum mechanics. Good luck. You might as well be feeding them uh, a modem handshake. That's that's what they're hearing on that side. And that's people are easy. The, the last thing I swear, uh, people are. You, you know, um, Sun Tzu, the Art of War, that that book. Okay, the, yep. the, the quote from that, I, I, most of the book, I mean, you take it with a grain of salt, it's military. But there is a great quote in there, and that is, people are like water. They will always take the path, path of least resistance. Flat Earth is now easier to explain to somebody than the globe model. Way easier. And people like easy. And there you go. That's, that's how we have leverage at this point. <laughs> Sorry, that's my... I, I definitely think you're correct right there. A lot of people don't understand the science, and when you try to explain it to them, it just they just glaze over it. Yeah. Um, like, for 
my most of my training is genetic biology, and I have seen like like you know, miracle pill. This will increase your life, for example. When I try to explain to them, well, that's not technically how telomeres work. You can't do that to you know, increase your life. They're then they will they will try to they will try to take the simple explanation as opposed to it, because it's very very hard for me to distill like five years of you know genetic biology knowledge I have to try to explain to a layman on a specific topic. If I could explain it easier, then it might be you know, easier for them to understand. But, most try lays over in yeah yeah absolutely right uh, mi- microwave yeah, ovens true or not. Ma- microwave ovens we've had them for yeah. 40 years 99 percent of the people out there have no idea how they work it's, uh, the, all they care about is that they do work you know it's like put you put your your bowl of, your cup cup of coffee in there you hit start it gets hot you pull it out you drink it they have no idea of the technology involved in that stupid oven and we've had it for four decades no one even bothers to learn so yeah okay i i think the last thing uh, about the documentary i want to uh kind of ask your opinion on is okay so they have a very colorful character matt uh Bolin, on there matt boylan um, yep. yep yeah yep. uh um Patty, yes, no, and uh refused to be on the documentary then i think <laughs> I, I i saw a bit of i saw some of the videos he posted online afterwards trying to say that the documentary lied and tried to make him out to be this, uh, you know, this villain when he really wasn't. Right. Um, but what's your experience with this individual? <laughs> oh, you asked the right guy because I've actually been with him <laughs> since the beginning of this. Uh, he was the okay. first, literally the first person to contact me after I made the Flat Earth Clues, literally. Um, I will say this, his instincts are pretty good. Uh, he called. He called me when I had like just Clue 8 had come out. And he asked me why I haven't been returning his texts. And I said, because I don't own a cell phone, or at least I didn't at the time. And his texts weren't going anywhere. <laughs> and he told me, and I still have the email to this day. He, he didn't, he, uh, the story in the, in the documentary was absolutely true, which was there were people that were contacting me wanting to talk to him. And he wouldn't talk to them because he played the whole, I'm aloof, I'm an artist, I'm, I, I can I can dictate what I want to say to the media. You know, people are like that every once in a while. And when I started interviewing, because people because he wouldn't talk to them, he wrote me and he said, "Okay, here's what I want you to do." Uh, he goes, "I want you to start building in some things to your interviews." He wanted to actually start controlling my own interviews. And he goes, first thing you do, I want you to start a- attacking the Catholic Church." And it's like, why, why why would I attack the Catholic Church? What have they got to do with it? Because especially the Jesuits. You got to attack the Jesuits. It's like, what are you talking about? No, Matt is exactly what he is on screen. They did not have to do. I mean, get a member. They they only grabbed just a fraction of his clips that are online. He is exactly as he's portrayed on on screen. Uh, he thinks that he invented flat Earth. He thinks that everybody else should be bowing down to him, and that they should all give him credit forever and ever. Amen. And he does not play well with others. I mean, he's the quintessential painter slash actor slash artist slash when I'm on stage, nobody upstages me. And it's, yeah, I I feel bad in a way because he, he, you know, I asked him several times. I said, look, get in front of this thing. I go, people, I I still have producers to this day. Heck, you're even asking. Hundreds of interviews later and people still ask me about Matt Boylan. Because he is an interesting guy. It's like watching a slow mo- motion motorcycle crash on, on film. Uh, he's an interesting guy on camera. Producers tell me. They say, oh yeah, he is interesting on camera. And yet he won't embrace what he is. He's just, he'll never be invited to the conferences. He'll never do this and that. He's, he's on his own, unfortunately. Do you think he's uh, genuinely insane or do you think he's playing a insane insane no paranoid yeah he's but it's but it's not because necessarily because of conspiracies it's because he's just i don't know he i think he wanted the world he part of it's just ego where uh, delusional ego more than anything he i mean he i will say this he's a hell of a painter he you know he was into acting for a little bit and i think he was on the cusp of some really good stuff and he just lost it 
at some point. I, I don't I don't know why. I don't I don't know the reason exactly why. Remember, you know, he's from he's not even from here. He's from he's Canadian. He's, from, he's from Montreal, and he uh, he came down to the United States, and and uh, I think he's trying to marry into citizenship, and he lives in. It's in, is he in Vegas now? I think he's in Vegas. I don't know. It's been such a long time since I talked to him. But uh, do I think he's completely insane? No. But he was the perfect villain to use. <laughs> okay. He was the perfect villain to use for the film, because uh, th- all the scientists which you saw on, on screen were very affable. They were very cordial and and nice, and they said everything with a smile. Matt was the only one that screamed in the camera. So it's like, well, we need we need an antagonist. I would have chosen him too. Okay. So does he have a big big enough following itself that affects the? He wants to start his own rival conference. No, 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 no. no, He could do that. No, 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 no. He he. But mostly because he doesn't play well with others, you can't you, you can't do your own conference if if literally you ally yourself with no one. Uh, Matt has been really really clear about that he does not like anyone. It's his way and that's it. There was a, I'll, I'll give you this one quote back in the day when people said, "Oh yeah, they they wanted to set up a uh, it wasn't even a debate. It was like this just this like a group hangout with Eric Dubé, which you didn't see in the movie, and me and Matt." And Matt goes on this video, and he just he just likes hitting the record button and just rambling. And during it, he said he goes he is talking with Dubay and Sergeant. He goes he goes why should I have to talk to them? It's my movement, you know. He's not he's not shy about saying that. He's he wants he, he was thinking of suing, like he uh, okay last part on this. He actually the, he went on this tear. He supposedly was calling all these lawyers. And trying to, because he wanted to sue everybody in the flat Earth community uh, for stealing hit from stealing his idea, and he was yelling at the camera because none of the lawyers would call him back. And it's like, can you imagine the message? If you were a lawyer and you got a message from this guy, what exactly it would sound like? Oh uh, yeah, I'm Matt Boyle and I invented flat Earth, and I want to sue everyone that's on YouTube that that's doing flat Earth videos. How do you even respond to that? It's just mind boggling. Oh God. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I guess there are a lot of colorful personalities within the flat earth uh, community. Is there like, is there fear that some might actually be true or plants or people trying to spread this information? No, um, no. And that you need to rein in? Not, not, not from my side. No, no, not at all. In fact, I've been pretty quick to say, I don't think there are, there are any shills. Um, Hmm. because if you were going to be a shill, eventually, like with any plot line, you have to go off road. The, the the plant or disinfo campaign is like you're going straight, you're going with people, you're going people, then all of a sudden you veer off. You, you I mean, that that is plot 101. You've got to go off somewhere which would damage Flat Earth in some capacity. And we've never seen that. I mean, like people accuse me of it all the time. It's like, well, uh, unless I've got a really long-term plan that's longer than four years doing this, I don't know when, when am I going to make my move. I have never seen anyone in the Flat Earth community do something – that severely damages the community uh, to where where loads of people quit the 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 when has it happened it hasn't happened yet even the documentary with as bad as they tried to paint us just added more fuel to the fire so if there is a if there is a a plant out there some disinfo agent uh, i haven't seen them not yet um, but on the other on the other hand, are there like bad uh, arguments that you've seen that you kind of want to be stopped? So, for example, in the uh, atheist community, um, uh, well-known spokesperson Matt Dillahunty, he says that he would rather the bad arguments not come from or the atheists if they do have a bad argument um, are corrected so that it doesn't make their side look bad. Do you see something similar within the flat earth community that you want to try to correct any bad oh. arguments or um, are you, are you more open-minded to let them yeah, say any I mean, arguments they want? There's a look I, what, what side do you take? The, the biggest arguments right now are in the Christian, yeah. are in the Christian side of things because since flat earth takes um, biblical literalism to an extreme to where there are a lot of people that are very reinforced with the fact that the Bible is a literal book and the flat earth is real and that the Bible is a flat earth book, they're now squaring off saying, if you don't follow this particular chapter and verse, 
then you know you're with us or against us and there are lines being drawn in the sand in the christian community which is unfortunate but come on that's we see this in religion time and time again so i'd yeah that'd be nice if those would go away but at the same time okay. I, what i try to tell people is it's never boring in the flat earth world uh, people are you know better to have troops that are you know being rivals at, without any permanent damage than being bored and that's what i've seen more often and besides even if i was going to take a side which side do i take you know i i don't know the answer okay. to it so if people have their their different views and different camps and fly their different flags hey great fantastic at least they have a flag and they're flying it uh i'd rather have that than just have people you know n with no enthusiasm and we have just got this overabundance of enthusiasm we, and mostly because we don't have a lot of common enemies on the science side. I mean, if Neil deGrasse Tyson decided to come out one day and take a huge stance against Flat Earth, I mean, really come at us, oh, that would galvanize us in two seconds. Same thing with well, Bill Nye to a lesser degree. Uh, other, you know, or... Uh, or yeah. Oh, um, sorry, go ahead. No, I, no. as, as someone who um, comes from the science side of things and um, actually uh, used to um, be a big fan of Neil deGrasse Tyson, write uh, letters to him, I actually kind of cringe when uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson and uh, uh, Bill Nye actually come onto the scene and try to act like they're the experts in science when they actually, like, they talk about topics that are completely outside their field right. and yeah. make i think like, it gives the wrong impression of science i think science should kind of be in the lab and in the research papers it shouldn't be on the celebrity status uh embarrassing themselves on like late night talk shows yeah i mean i, I agree uh, but at the same time i mean for us we need an opponent so i'm going to be rooting for him like brian cox he's my new mission <laughs> um brian cox oh. because he came out and said that uh that flat earth was never a thing that's the part that's hmm. blowing me away it's where i had to revise my speech for when i go over there uh to england to do it which is he said that flat earth was never even a concept I meaning it was like a myth like like hmm. like nobody believed like he basically he's, i'm not kidding he's literally saying nobody believed in flat earth at some point and and it's like, it, it, what sort of denial is that like what are you talking about it's like flat earth of course was a thing that that is yeah, I mean, real... maybe in some parts of the Western world, but that's obviously wrong because I know East Asia um, and Central Asia and the Abrahamic faith, oh, uh, no, where the I, Abrahamic I, faith I, spread, they, they choreographically I, believe in flat absolutely. earth. Absolutely. <laughs> I've got a list as long as my arm of, of civilizations that thought it was a flat earth. So for him to say, not only is it not a thing now, it was never a thing. It's like, whoa. It's like, I, 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 re I, I appreciate a good defense as a good offense, but you're not going to get any traction there. Because everybody knows, everybody knows that one, I mean, hell, the, the men in black line alone would, would sink him, which is 500 years ago. Everybody knew the earth was flat. And sorry, Tommy Lee Jones takes precedence over, uh, uh, over <laughs> Brian Cox. All right. Well, um, yeah, thank you for uh, having this conversation yeah. uh, with me. I think it's uh, been very, very informative. And definitely you are, you are a very great uh, um, interviewer. You are... Well, you you are probably one of the best spokespersons if um if flat earth should have a spokesperson you obviously come out as you don't come out as the i guess the matt bowen side of things you actually are respectful and try to explain your views um is there anything that you might want to uh i guess um any topics you might want to kind of say last minute before we uh, round things up um no what i what i try to end hey, with is, th is this which is uh to anyone that might be listening do not take my word for it. Don't believe anything I say, uh, because who am I? I'm just a guy, you know, who makes YouTube videos. Um, do your own research. How do you know the world is a globe now? Can you prove the globe in a court of law right now? And if you think you can, try to work that out in your head and do your own research and ask questions and see where it leads you. And I have a feeling hmm. for quite a few people uh, that it will lead them to the same place that I did, which is I can't prove it anymore. So it will, the answer has got to be somewhere else. There you go. You know, that might actually be a fun uh, panel to have at your next uh, Flat Earth conference, um, a debate with someone who thinks they could make the closing argument. Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. All right. 
Well, All right. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, anything you want to plug um, before we go? Uh, uh, no, no just, Google, just Google Flat Earth Clues. That's all you find me. Uh, my name is Mark Sargent, and uh, my, my stuff, I'm not hard to find now, uh, even though it would have been nice five years ago to be remain hard to find. That is not the case. <laughs> Uh, if if anyone wants to email me, my email address, my phone number, my physical address, it's all in the in the description box of every single video that I make. And uh, yeah, looking forward to okay. hearing from you. All right, uh, thank you very much, Ben. Um, I guess uh, when I guess when you have the uh, recording ready, feel free to send it uh, my way, I and will, then I can I will uh, drop it try in, to get it up. I will drop it into Skype the second I hang up with you. Okay. okay. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm so I'm not sure when I'm going to release the episodes yet because I'm still I'm still kind of new to the YouTube game. No so I'm going to uh, I'll get you a link when ready. It'll probably be within a month or two because I have a bunch of conventions myself that- lined up. Um, but when I get the episode up, I'll definitely give you a link and yeah, you're free to share it um, wherever. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.